Hello, and welcome to Idea Nexus, a channel about gaming and computer science. Back in May, a member of the Magic Arena community shared a teaser about a new digital collectible card game from the folks behind the Hearthstone card game called Marvel Snap. I checked out the initial details of the game and got really excited about it, so it felt like I won the lottery when I got my closed beta invite at the end of May. And since installing it, I've been maybe spending far too much time playing according to my digital well-being tracker, but time you enjoyed wasting was not wasted, and I've been having a blast wasting my time with this game. An important disclaimer here, this video is not an endorsement of the Marvel Snap application. While I really enjoy the gameplay at the time of recording this video, the application is still in beta, and while this is an amazing development team, they are still working out aspects of the game like its economy and rewards system that could impact users' enjoyment of the game. Instead, this is a video about the fascinating mathematics we can apply to Marvel Snap in terms of possible deck combinations, card draw combinations, and card draw probabilities. This is a video about combinatorics, and Marvel Snap's 12 unique card decks make it an excellent system for introducing what can become extremely heavy mathematical concepts when dealing with more complex card drawing situations. I would describe Marvel Snap as Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone meets poker. In the game, players construct decks made of 12 unique cards and bring them to battle for control over three random locations that will generate effects impacting the gameplay. The player who wins takes points that will advance them up the competitive ladder. That's the collectible card game aspect of it. The poker part comes with the snap mechanic, where players can double the number of points the winner takes at the end of the game to advance up the ladder, and that the loser forfeits dropping down the ladder. Marvel Snap is from some of the top creative forces behind Blizzard's Hearthstone, a collectible card game that makes fantastic use of the digital medium. In Hearthstone, each creature card has its own life total. There are cards that summon random rare cards from other sets into play that you don't have to own. There are cards that shuffle random unknown cards into your deck. Hearthstone is a card game with many mechanics that cannot exist in the real-world tabletop space, or would be a huge headache to execute in real life. Marvel Snap is also a game that can only exist in the digital world. It's full of effects that summon random cards into your hand or into play. There are even locations and cards that will take over and play the game for you. In contrast to complete information games like chess or checkers, I think this digitally inspired randomness makes Marvel Snap highly accessible to players of all skill levels. To elaborate on this point, if we were to pit my 8-year-old son against Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura in a chess match, my son will lose 99.9999999% of the time, because chess is a complete information game with zero randomness. The only chance my son has of winning is if lightning were to strike Nakamura during the game, and that's why I didn't say 100%. But if we put my 8-year-old in a Magic the Gathering match against World Championship player Paulo Vitor Damo de Rosa, he might win one game in 20, or even one game in 10, thanks to the game's randomness. With equal decks, PVDDR will eventually get a weak hand, or my son may eventually get a strong hand, and randomness will tilt the game. That's the fun of randomness. It gives weaker players a chance to have fun too, and Marvel Snap, while still in beta, is clearly working out how much randomness is fun for the casual players without aggravating the competitive ones. This means I can play around with some pretty janky decks and have fun boosting up cards I normally wouldn't have a chance of winning with. Ooh, shiny. But I think my favorite design choice the Marvel Snap creators have made is the 12 card deck. First off, 12 is the coolest number. It's divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. If you break something into 12 parts, you can make all these easy, intuitive fractions out of the combinations you get from the set. Because of the snap mechanic, it's nice to be able to do some mental math as we play to estimate our chances of drawing our trap or bomb card. Let's say I've got my Nova card in hand, but I need Killmonger to destroy it, and all of my opponent's one-cost cards, to trigger Nova's ability, giving all of my cards on the board plus one power. What are the chances I'm going to draw Killmonger in the remaining turns of the game if my opponent snaps? One way to look at this in Marvel Snap is to look at the number of cards we have left to draw and divide it by the number of cards left in our deck. Before the game starts, we have nine cards to draw from a 12-card deck throughout the game, giving us a 75% chance of drawing a specific card. Each turn we don't draw that specific card, our chances of drawing it diminish until turn 6 when we only have a 1 in 4 or 25% chance of drawing that card. 
This is a useful way to think about it if you're in a tense game and wondering if you should retreat because you haven't seen your combo card by a certain point in the game. If I don't have Killmonger by turn 5 and my opponent snaps, I should retreat. When deck building on a power curve, I normally want to see my low cost cards early and my high cost later, so looking at this table of probabilities, which includes those lovely 12 factor fractions, we can mentally estimate how many 1 cost and how many 6 cost cards to throw in. We've got a 1 in 3 chance of drawing specific cards on turn 1 and a 3 in 4 chance of drawing specific cards by turn 6. Marvel Snap's designers have also cleverly provided a lot of ways to manipulate these probabilities. The card Quicksilver always starts in your hand, you will always draw Domino on turn 2, and one of my favorite cards is America Chavez, which you will always draw on turn 6 and not before. Including America Chavez in your deck functionally makes it an 11 card deck for the first 5 turns. If there's a card you want to draw before turn 6, including America Chavez gives you an additional 3 to 6% chance of drawing that card each turn. It also gives you a 0% chance of drawing that card on turn 6, as you'll be drawing America Chavez that turn. One really fun card that very cleverly takes advantage of the digital medium is Agatha Harkness, who I only know from the WandaVision show. So long as Agatha is in your hand, she plays your cards for you randomly. She's 13 power, which is huge for a 6 cost card, so if you can mitigate her randomness, she can be a powerful play. Agatha always starts in your hand, but does not count against your hand size, so you still draw 4 cards on the first turn. Another important characteristic of Agatha's algorithm is that, while she plays cards randomly out of your hand, she will always play herself if possible. Because of this, if you can get her to play Wave on turn 3, a card that makes all cards in players' hands cost 4, Agatha will play herself on turn 4, freeing you to play other bomb cards from your hand. So a deck playing Agatha will try to make her as deterministic as possible. Quicksilver always starts in your opening hand, so if you don't include other 1 cost cards, Agatha will play Quicksilver every turn 1. Same for Domino, who you always draw on turn 2. Finally, we really want to see Wave on turn 3 to get Agatha out of our hand on turn 4 to take back control of our deck, so we include America Chavez to further improve our chances of an earlier Wave draw. Agatha, Quicksilver, Domino, and America Chavez's deterministic card draws turns a 12 card deck into an 8 card deck for calculating our card draw probabilities. In this table, I've laid out what this looks like each turn. We're drawing 3 of 8 cards on turn 1, 0 cards on turn 2, and by turn 3 we have a coin toss's probability of having Wave in our hand to bring Agatha out on turn 4. This probability of having Wave on turn 3 is the same probability we would have in a 12 card deck without deterministic card draws, but the difference here is that we are guaranteed to have Agatha in our hand on turn 3, whereas a non-deterministic deck would only have a 22.7% chance of having this 2 card combo by turn 3. At first glance, all of this seems deceptively simple. A snap deck is made up of only 12 unique cards, and you're going to draw 9 of those during the game. I constructed this ramp and camp deck that uses Psylocke and Wave to let me play bomb cards early to overpower locations and then lock down those locations for the win using Storm and Professor X to prevent opponents from playing cards on them. I went so far as to flowchart out all the different ways to play the deck. If I have Psylocke and Jubilee in my hand on turn 2, play that combo. Storm and either Juggernaut or Jubilee on turn 3, play one of those combos. I mistakenly assumed that with just 12 cards I could play by script and dominate the latter. Ha ha, ha 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 ha. So let's look to combinatorics to understand the many reasons why I was so misguided. My first mistake was thinking 12 cards meant less variability than a Magic deck. A Magic the Gathering deck is 60 cards and allows 4 copies of any non land card. An optimal 60 card Magic deck runs 24 lands, leaving 36 cards. Following the best practice of running 4 copies of each unique card means that there are actually only about 9 unique cards in a magic deck in comparison to Marvel Snap's 12. Now there are vastly more possible combinations of cards in a magic deck's 60 cards. With 24 lands and 4 of each card, you can draw many combinations that include multiple copies. I won't go into the math of calculating all the possible combinations in a magic deck due to its complexity, but calculating the possible combinations for a standard deck of 52 playing cards is pretty straightforward. And there are 80 unvingentillion, 658, uh, 
There are a lot of ways to shuffle a deck of 52 cards. So many, in fact, that after shuffling, you are likely to be the only person in history to hold that exact configuration of cards in your hand. The function to calculate the number of possible configurations for a set of objects is called a factorial. This function multiplies the number, n, by every number below it. The exclamation mark represents the factorial function, and any time we see an exclamation mark attached to a variable or a number in this video, we are putting that variable into the factorial function. Plugging Marvel Snap's 12-card deck into the factorial function multiplies 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times yada 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 and outputs 479,000,600 possible combinations. Remember this factorial function. It will be a basic building block of other functions we will use to calculate card draw probabilities in a moment. Knowing how many potential combinations there are to a 12-card deck brings us to the next question. How many potential card draws can we pull from that deck? On turn 1, we've drawn 33.3% of our deck, and by turn 6, we've drawn 75% of it. That seems like a lot of cards to draw, and it is, but there's still an impressive degree of variability at work here, and that variability will have a huge impact on a high percentage of your games. To calculate the number of possible opening hands, we can use a function known as the binomial coefficient. And, as you can see, it's full of factorials. In this equation, the variable n represents the number of cards in our deck, and k represents the number of cards we are drawing from that deck. So for a deck of 52 cards, drawing a 5-card hand gives us about 2.5 million possible poker hands. In Marvel Snap, we have a 12-card deck, and we draw 4 cards on the first turn. Plugging these numbers into the binomial coefficient function, Running the factorials, multiplication, and division, we find 495 possible opening hands to play from on turn 1. A 12-card deck contains a bit more variability than we might into it. But the possible deck and hand combinations aren't really useful beyond trivia. Marvel Snap and other customizable card games are about pulling off awesome card combos and synergies. You can play Bucky Barnes and have Carnage devour him to transform 3 power into 10 power for 4 energy. You can drop Kingpin on turn 4 and follow up with Arrow to destroy all the cards your opponent plays on turn 5. Or drop Storm to flood a location where you're winning, followed by Juggernaut to punch away any cards your opponent might play on the last turn before the location gets locked down. Play Cosmo on a location and you can later play Destroyer there to get 14 power without having to destroy your other cards. With so many great combos, it's useful to know how often we can expect to pull them off. To calculate this, we turn to multivariate hypergeometric distribution. You'll note this function is filled with binomial coefficients. In the numerator, we are multiplying the binomial coefficients of the possible card draws for the cards that we are looking for, and those that we aren't looking for to get all possible card combinations that have the cards we want. Then we divide that by the total possible card combinations we can draw from our deck, which is listed in the denominator. Here's what the multivariate hypergeometric distribution function looks like calculating the odds of us drawing a two-card combo in a four-card opening hand from a 12-card Marvel Snap deck. We can see here the binomial coefficients for each card in our two-card combo and a third function for the other ten cards, of which we will draw two. On the bottom, we have 12 over 4, representing all the possible four-card draw combinations we can pull from our 12-card deck. Notice here that the sum of the top inputs for our binomial coefficients here add up to 12 because we have 12 total cards in our deck, while the bottom three numbers in these functions add up to 4 to match the four cards total we are drawing. Multiply these three functions in the numerator together and we get the total number of card draw combinations possible with just the specific cards we want. Because the first two functions output 1, we can ignore them and just compute the possible combinations of two cards drawn from the 10 we don't care about. This gives us 45 possible desired opening hands divided by the 495 total possible hands for a 9.1% chance of getting our combo in the turn 1 draw. Marvel Snap also has a few noteworthy powerful 3-card combos. One example is playing Lady Sif to discard the Infinite from your hand, and then playing Ghost Rider to cheat out Infinite, gaining 20 power for 5 energy. Another powerful combo is playing Wave to make Destroyer cost 4. 
Destroyer blows up everything on your board, making Death, which gets a cost discount for every card destroyed, an affordable play. To calculate our odds of drawing our three card combo, we add another binomial coefficient to our equation like so, and decrement the number of cards we don't want by one to keep it a 12 card deck and a four card hand. This leaves us with only nine possible combinations of opening hands. Dividing nine by 495 gives us only a 1.8% chance of drawing these three cards on turn one. Likewise, if we want to calculate our odds of drawing a combo on turn two, having drawn five cards, we simply add another card to our hand in both the numerator and denominator, like so. And again, to calculate drawing six cards by turn three. Don't be concerned about having to do this math yourself. There are calculators that will do it for you, and I'll show you how to use an excellent one of them in a moment. Here's the probabilities for drawing a combo by turn. Many combos require us to have specific cards by earlier turns to successfully pull them off. So which turn's probabilities are important to you will depend on the combo you're looking to execute. For example, looking at turn five, we've got a 42.4% chance of holding a specific two card combo. Here's an interesting example of how these odds impacted the beta. One very broken combo in the game's first season was Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. You could play Moon Girl on turn 5 to get two Devil Dinosaurs in your hand, and then play both of those on turn 6 for a possible 20 to 30 power split across two locations. Having an over 40% chance of playing this combo meant everyone played it, so the cards were quickly rebalanced to make both cards cost one more energy. This meant having to play Moon Girl on turn 4 to play a Devil Dinosaur on turns 5 and 6. On turn 4, you have a 32% chance of pulling the full powerful combo off instead of the 42% chance of playing a weaker combo on turn 5. Even with multiple combos in our deck, having a coin flip's chance of pulling any single combo makes for a highly inconsistent deck performance. To improve the consistency and synergy of our deck, we include functionally equivalent combo pieces. These are different cards that perform the same function and can dramatically improve the odds of pulling off a combo in our deck. I really like the word function in this term to describe cards, because each card very much acts like the functions we use in computer programming. We input energy, and the cards output unique behaviors. For example, if we can destroy Nova, we can score up to four additional power in some of our locations. In terms of combo pieces with Nova, the cards Carnage, Venom, and Deathlock will all serve the same function in destroying Nova. The equation you see here is more abstract because of the online calculator I'm using, but plugging these three functionally equivalent combo pieces into our multivariate hypergeometric distribution function scores us a 22% chance of drawing our combo on turn one over the 9% chance we'd get with just two cards. Here's another, slightly more complex example. Psylocke, Wave, and Electro are functionally equivalent combo pieces that allow us to ramp into bigger plays earlier so we can drop more costly bomb cards during the game. Then, we can select three other functionally equivalent cards that are big and costly like Magneto, Giganto, and Hulk to serve as the second part of the combo. And so, we get a 52% chance of pulling one of each of the functionally equivalent cards we need on turn one. By turn three, the turn when we actually have enough energy to start our combo, we have an 82% chance of holding two of our combo cards in hand. Throw America Chavez into our deck to make it function like an 11 card deck like we did with the Agatha Harkness example earlier, and we can tweak the turn three odds up to 88%. So to summarize, we've got a factorial function taking an input of the number of cards in our deck and outputting the number of possible combinations that are possible with it. Then we have the binomial coefficient function, which calls factorial functions to output the number of possible card draw combinations from a deck of cards, size n, and the number of cards drawn from it, k. And finally, we have the multivariate hypergeometric distribution function, which multiplies the binomial coefficients of the cards we want to draw and divides that by the binomial coefficient of all the possible card draws from our deck. While all of these functions calling functions calling functions are fascinating, manually calculating all of these components is extremely tedious and error prone. Luckily, there are kind folks online who have programmed calculators that do everything we've covered so far in this video. 
Deculator, seen here, was crafted by Michael B. Moore and is the one I found most enlightening of those I tried because it shows you the multivariate hypergeometric distribution function your inputs generate. I've been using those function outputs in many of my slides throughout this video. There are the equations with the light green backgrounds. Being able to see the generated formula was really important for me to understand how this function works and to see whether I was getting my inputs right. Here's an example of using Deculator to calculate our chances of pulling a two-card Nova-Killmonger combo. We have one copy each of Nova and Killmonger in our deck, and we want to draw those copies into our hand. Then, we have ten other cards in our deck that we don't care about, so we leave zero for how many we want in our initial draw. Remember that the sum of the deck column needs to add up to the number of cards in our deck, 12 for Marvel Snap and 60 for Magic the Gathering. And finally, we are drawing four cards into our initial hand. Let's say we complement Killmonger with the functionally equivalent cards Carnage, Venom, and Deathlock to destroy Nova. That gives us four Nova destruction cards in our deck from which we want to draw one, which means we need to decrement the other cards down to seven to keep our deck total at 12. If we are most concerned with having this combo by turn five, then we add four card draws here. Here's one more example for my fellow Magic players out there. Here's my weaker version of a deck crafted by the Zen Master Magic YouTuber Legend VD, titled Deadly Defense. The two key cards in this deck are Huatli and Assault Formation. There are four of each of these cards in the deck, and they allow our creatures to deal damage equal to their toughness rather than their power. For non-Magic players, this just means that they get to attack with their defense. So we plug 8 Attack with Defense cards into the equation and 52 other cards, giving us a 70% chance of drawing one of the key cards in our deck. Then the deck has 24 cards that are cheap and heavy on defense that will get buffed by the Attack with Defense cards. Plugging the 24 defensive creatures into the equation and needing to draw at least one in our opening hand gives us a 69% chance of having the combo at the start of the game. We also have 22 lands in our deck, we can break these down into forests and plains and others, but I'm going to just lump them all together in here. To have a chance of pulling off our combo, I think we need at least two lands in our opening hand, needing two lands, one card to turn defense into attack, and at least one defensive creature, we have about a 59% chance of having this in our opening hand, a little better than a coin toss. In Magic, you have the option to mulligan a bad hand for a new one, but you have to put one card back into the deck after you draw. So if I don't draw the cards I want the first time, I can flip the coin and try again. I could hypothetically flip the coin three or four times with excellent odds of getting the four card hand I want. So that's Deculator, a program that hides away all the messy functions within functions that make up calculating multivariate hypergeometric distribution. In computer science, we call this abstraction. We are abstracting all the messy complexity of calculating our card draw odds behind a simple interface where all we need to do is set our inputs and observe the outputs that come from them. If this subject has interested you and you want to start playing with these functions while the concepts are fresh in your mind, I've provided links below to a factorial calculator, a binomial coefficient calculator, and, most importantly, the Deculator Multivariate Hypergeometric Distribution Calculator, so you can play with all these different components to solidify your understanding of how they all combine and interact when calculating your own card drawing probabilities. Armed with the introduction to this subject I've provided in this video, if you are a Magic player interested in calculating the draw odds for your own deck, I highly recommend Frank Karsten's of Channel Fireball's 2018 article, An Introduction to Multivariate Hypergeometric Distribution for Magic Players. This article was really helpful for me in getting over some of the conceptual hurdles I was having in comprehending certain aspects of the function. If you're a Marvel Snap player, I want to thank MarvelSnap.io for providing me with the ability to search the entire card database complete with the images used in this video, and for letting visitors use their deck builder without having to sign up for an account. Finally, I've also provided a reference, without a link, to a 1999 paper by John Pryras titled The Mathematics of Magic the Gathering, A Study in Probability, Statistics, Strategy, and Game Theory, which you can search for to find a PDF of an excellent old paper on this subject that is still insightful and relevant today.
I really enjoyed making this video and the opportunity to take such a deep dive into these algorithms and understanding them. I hope you've enjoyed learning about them as well and that you come away from this video with the know-how to use these algorithms in calculating your own deck drawing probabilities in any deck building game you may play. Thank you for watching.